Hello, and welcome to the second session of the Advanced RSET webinar series, Using Earth Observations to Monitor Water Budgets for River Basin Management. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm joined today with my colleague, Dr. Amita Mekta. Wherever you are joining us from, welcome, and we hope you are keeping safe. This is the second part of a three-part webinar series. In today's session, we'll be estimating the water budget for the Limpopo River Basin using remote sensing observations. Our study area is the Limpopo River Basin in southeastern Africa. We'll be estimating the water budget for the basin and subbasins using the data downloaded in exercise one for the dry and wet seasons. The objectives of today's webinar are for you to replicate the steps for estimating seasonal water budget components for a river basin and sub-basins using remote sensing products, QGIS, and spreadsheet software, and to understand the source of uncertainties involved in estimating water budgets for river basins. As a reminder, there are three two-hour sessions each week. The first part of each session will be a short presentation followed by a demonstration on data access, calculations, and analysis for estimating water budgets. The second part of each session will be a lab time for you to ask questions to the trainers and to replicate the steps provided in the demonstration to gain hands-on experience through computer-based exercises. Homework assignments will be available after all three sessions from the RSET website for this specific training. Answers must be submitted via Google Form with the due dates of August 11th, 18th, and 25th for each assignment. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all webinars and complete all homework assignments. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. Attendees that do not complete the prerequisites provided the links below will not be adequately prepared for the pace of the training. It is very important to have also registered on NASA Earth data using the link provided. It is also very important to have the latest version of QGIS installed on your machine. Currently, that is version 3.14. Some of the tools used in exercises two and three are not available in previous versions of the software. The outline for today's session will be as follows. We'll have a review of what was covered last week, Next, there will be a demonstration on how to estimate seasonal water budget components for the Limpopo River Basin and subbasins for 2016 using remote sensing products, QGIS, and spreadsheet software. The remainder of today's webinar will be provided as lab time for you to replicate the steps in the demonstration to estimate uh, seasonal water budgets for the year 2019. In the first part of this webinar series, we defined a river basin and discussed the importance of river basin management. We identified key components in the watershed contributing to the flow. We covered and explained the water budget equation for estimating water budgets in a river basin and subbasins. We provided an overview of remote sensing and GLDOS, GLDOS model data for estimating water budgets. We demonstrated how to download remote sensing and GeoDOS data for the Limpopo River Basin for the wet and the dry seasons in the year 2016. Lastly, we organized a lab time for you to download remote sensing and GeoDOS data for the same river basin for the wet and dry seasons for the year 2019. And we hosted a question and answer session to address any questions you had from the first part of the, of the training. The question and answer document from week one will be posted to our training page uh, on the RSET website later this week. For this demonstration, we'll be walking you through the steps of estimating seasonal water budgets for the Limpopo River Basin and Subbasins for the year 2016. As a reminder, this demonstration is using data from 2016. The data you downloaded from week one uh, in lab is from 2019. The 2019 data is what you will use to complete exercise two. 
First, we'll launch the QGIS application and save the project to our working directory. You can find that by going to Project and then clicking Save As. And I'm already in my working directory, so I'll give it a, an appropriate name such as River Basin Water Budget Demo 2, and I'll click Save. Next, we'll add a base map by going to the menu bar and clicking on Web and going to Quip Quick Map Services. For this demonstration, I'll be using the Google Road base map, but feel free to use any of the base maps that you prefer. Next, we'll add the shapefile of the Limpopo River subbasins, which you access from the training page from the RSET website. I've already downloaded this to my working directory, so I can go and navigate to my working directory, and I will click on the Limpopo River subbasins level 4.shape, and again, you can access this shapefile from the RSET website. I will click Add and then Close, and then I can right-click and click Zoom to Layer. Next, to change the symbology of the shapefile, you can right-click and go to Symbology. And under uh, Simple Fill, where it says Symbol Layer Type, you can select Outline Simple Line. Next, I'm going to change the color to blue and give it a stroke width of 1. And I'll click OK. Now we have uh, a simple line delineating all the sub-basins, and we have our base map. Now that we have our map project saved with our Limpopo River sub-basins, let's start adding the remote sensing data downloaded from week one. In your QGIS map, click on the Add Raster function on the left. Navigate to the iMERGE precipitation data downloaded in session one. And in this case, I'll be selecting the 2016 data because that's what I'm working on for this demonstration. I'll click Add, and then I'll click Close. Now to change the symbology, I'll go to the, uh, the wet season, and I'll use the drop-down to select Single Band Pseudo Color. And then for the minimum, I will select 50. And for the maximum, I will select 430. And then for the color ramp, I want the red, yellow, blue. And for the mode, we're going to select equal interval, and I'm going to give it 10 different classes, and then I'll click OK. Now to symbolize for the dry season, we'll do the same thing. We can right click, and for render type, we'll choose single band pseudo color. And for the min, I'm going to choose zero. And for the max, I'm going to choose 110. And we already have the red, yellow, blue color ramp as a default, so I'll leave that alone. And for the mode, I'll choose equal interval. And again, I'm going to use 10 different classes. And I'm going to click OK. Now that we have the precipitation for the wet and dry seasons loaded in our project, We'll add the modus evapotranspiration data and do the same, do some pre-processing so it's ready for analysis. All of the modus evapotranspiration files will go to the add raster icon and we will navigate to our working directory where we saved all of the ET files. And you can hold down shift and click left click to select all the files and then click add. And once we see the files in our layers panel, we can close out of this window. Before we can sum the evapotranspiration over the entire wet and then over the entire dry seasons, we first need to reclassify all of the fill values in each data set and assign a new value of zero so they're not included in the calculation. It is important you have the latest version of QGIS installed on your machine to perform this step. Previous versions of QGIS do not have the tool that we're about to use. So I'll start typing in reclass. And the first tool that comes up is the reclassify values range. That is the tool that we want, so I'll re-double click it. And then in the bottom left corner, I'm going to click on run as batch process. Underneath the grid column, you can click on the ellipse and click select from open layers. And in this case, I want to select all of the um, all of the ET files from the wet season. And again, you can notice that these are Julian days. So I will go to all the Julian days 
through the wet season. So the break here is between day 57 and day 153, uh, delineating the difference between the wet and the dry. So I'll go ahead and click OK. And for the minimum value uh, that we want to reclassify, I'm going to go ahead and type in 32760. And then under autofill, we can click fill down. And that will fill in all of the minimum values for each of the data sets. Then for the maximum value that we want to reclassify, We'll go ahead and type in 32767 and again click on autofill fill down. And then for the new value that we want to assign each of these fill values, which is zero, we can go ahead and click autofill. And that takes the range of 32760 to 32767 for each of the files and reclassifies uh, that range to zero. For the operator, we want the zero which is the less than or equal to. And again, we'll go to autofill and fill down. And we can leave the rest of the parameters as default. And under the reclassified grid, which is where we will output our file, we can go and click on the ellipse. And I'm already in my working directory. So in this case, I will give it an appropriate name. In this case, I'm going to call it mode et underscore 2016 underscore wet for the wet season and I'll go ahead and click save and when I do click save it'll prompt me if I want to autofill the values below it and I do so I'll use the drop down and I'll say autofill with numbers and click OK and what we can see is each of the consecutive Julian dates for the wet season from 2015 to 2016 is now numbered so Another very important step is in the bottom left corner of the window to select load layers on completion. Once we have this all set, we'll go ahead and click run. It takes around 30 seconds for the tool to run as a batch process. When the tool is finished, we will have all of the eight day files for the wet season reclassified with fill values equal to zero. Again, this is a very important step so that we can sum all of the files for the wet season. Now we'll go back up to the parameters tab and click on that. And now we want to remove all the files currently. So we can do that by holding down shift and left clicking and then going to the red uh, remove row and now we'll click on the ellipse again and select from open files. But this time we only want to select the files for the dry season. And the dry season starts on Julian day 153 for 2016. So what I'm going to do is select each of these 12 files for the dry season. And once I have them all selected, I'll go ahead and click OK. And then Something to know is when you run the tool again, it defaults back to the default parameters. So you're going to have to go and fill down again to make sure that each of these files is going to be reclassed from this range here to this value. And then also, don't forget the operator for range to fill that one down as well. Once we've done all of that, we can go back to our file and click on the ellipse. And in this time, we will go ahead and enter, instead of the wet season, we'll enter the MODIS Evapotranspiration 2016 dry. And again, when we click Save, it gives us the autofill mode. And in this case, again, we want to fill with numbers. And go ahead and click OK. And again, this numbers all of the Julian days throughout the dry season, 1 through 12. And again, important to make sure that the load layers on completion is checked, and we can go ahead and click Run. Again, this should take roughly 20 to 30 seconds. And again, this is reclassifying all of the fill values for the dry season for the evapotranspiration products, and reclassifying all of those fill values as zero, so that when we do a summation from uh, from the beginning to the end of the dry season, we're only adding the values for evapotranspiration and we're not adding anything else. Once the tool is finished running, 
we can remove the downloaded 8-day modus files from your layers panel. You can do so by going to your layer panel and finding all the files that you originally downloaded and you can click on one of them and then hold down shift and left click and then we can go up to the icon for remove layer and it's going to ask us if we want to remove the 25 layers that we downloaded yes and now we're left with the evapotranspiration that has been reclassified Next, we'll sum all reclassified 8-day files to derive the total evapotranspiration for each season. To do so, we'll go to the menu bar and we'll click on Raster and then Raster Calculator. For the wet season, double-click on each file one at a time to enter the Raster Calculation expression uh, separated by the plus operator. So for the wet season, we're going to be looking for everything labeled as such. We'll just go one by one. And then we'll go to the working directory and we'll give it a name such as modus underscore et underscore djf for December, January, February, and we'll give it the name 16. And we'll go ahead and click Save, and we'll go ahead and click OK. And we can see that it's been added down here, which is good. Go ahead and drag that down. And now we're going to do the same thing for the dry season. So we'll go to raster and raster calculator. And this time we're going to be adding each of the dry season files that we just reclassified separated by the plus operator. In this case, there are 12 files that we need to add. Okay, and then we're going to go back to our working directory, and we're already there. So this time, we're going to give it a name similar to the last file we just named, but this time we're going to name it uh, June, July, August, and 16. And now that we have that, we'll go ahead and click Save, and we'll go ahead and click OK. Now we can go ahead and remove all of the files that we used to generate them to clean up our layers panel. So we'll go ahead and remove all of those, making sure that we're not removing anything we don't want to, like this file here. And everything looks good. And we'll go ahead and click on the remove layer icon. And that cleans up our layer panel quite nicely. Next thing we want to do is rescale each of the evapotranspiration data by 0.1 so that we can drive evapotranspiration in millimeters. So again, we're going to go back to raster and raster calculator. And in the raster bands window, we'll go ahead and select the wet season. And for the operator, we'll do you multiply. We'll multiply by 0.1. And then for the output, we'll go ahead and give it a name et underscore djf 16 and we'll go ahead and click save and go ahead and click ok and we'll do the same thing for the dry season so we'll use the raster calculator and we'll select the dry season and again for the operator we want the multiplication and we'll multiply by 0.1 to convert this into millimeters and this time I'm just going to rename it June, July, August, JJA, and click Save, and then click OK. Now I'll go ahead and remove the modus ET layers that we're no longer using. So I'll go ahead and get that out to clean up our layers panel a little bit more. Finally, we'll give the evapotranspiration layers a different symbology and assign a no data value. 
So we can go ahead and right click or just double click on one of the files and go to Symbology. And we'll, again, we'll go to Single Band Pseudo Clutter, Pseudo Color, and we'll keep the min and max because the, uh, but this time we're actually going to give a different color. We're going to go to the, um, to the color ramp and we'll go to all colors. And this time we're going to go to yellow and green. For the mode, we're going to use equal interval. And again, we're going to use 10 classes. And we go, go ahead and click OK. And then for the dry season, we'll go ahead and do the same thing. We'll go to single band pseudo color. Uh, it's defaulted to the color ramp I want, which is good. Uh, but for the mode, again, we want equal interval. Uh, that way we can change the number of classes. And I'm going to give it class number 10 again. And now what we want to do is assign the no data value. So what I'll do is double click on that and go to transparency. And for additional no data value, enter zero and click OK. And then for the, uh, the wet season, again, we're also going to give it a no data value of zero uh, under transparency and click OK. And so now what we've got, if I drag the shape file to the top, uh, we've got both of the um, rescaled uh, evapotranspiration files for the wet and dry season summed over the season. And we have our, um, we have our uh, shape file and base map included in the project. I will now hand the demonstration over to Amita to add the grace data to the project and she will go ahead and estimate the water budget for the Limpopo, Limpopo River Basin as well as the sub-basins. So Amita, over to you. Thank you, Sean. So now I'm going to continue with the same project. As you can see, I have uh, the layers that Sean already added, that is iMERGE precipitation and MODIS evapotranspiration. And what we're going to do is now add gray terrestrial water storage anomaly data because we want to know what the seasonal change in water storage is. So keep in mind that the grace data are actually derived from change in gravity, gravitational field of Earth with respect to a reference gravity level. So month by month changes in gravity are interpreted as, as change in water thickness month to month with respect to that reference. So what we have is month by month change in water storage. When we want to say know about how much water storage change um, in December say, what we're going to do is take difference between January and December. So the assumption here is that precipitation and evapotranspiration that occurred in December, uh, right away terrestrial water storage um, is not going to change but what you're assuming is that by end of this month whatever change in terrestrial water storage you see is because of the processes occurred in December. So what you have left uh, at the end of December going into January and what happened in January and what happened in December, that difference gives you the change in water storage. That's the assumption here. And so what for December, we take difference between January and December. For January, it is February and January. And for February, it is March and February. So for entire season between December and February, December, January, February, February, you will be taking difference between March and December. So that is what we are going to do. So first, okay, and then for June, July, August, it will be June and September. So let's start by adding grace data. So here is my working directory where I have uh, December grace data. I'm going to add that. And I'm also going to add March 16, add. Now, I want to add these for June and September for dry season. I have June 16, but when we started working with this project, we realized that grace data for September 16 is missing. So the first thing we decided, okay, let's look at another year, but that is not the solution. This happens many times that some months are missing. So how can one work with that? And we will 
to that we will see that we will discuss that at the end of this demonstration and after your exercise but for now what we decided is that okay let's focus on wet season how to uh, calculate different components including this water storage change when you do the exercise for 18 19 you will not have this problem all the months are there so you will be able to do dry and wet season uh, components and your exercise has step-by-step -step instruction for that for demonstration what we're going to do is let's focus on wet season first so that um, we know the procedure how to do this and then towards the end of um, today's session we will discuss about missing data and what other assumptions can be made or how to mitigate this so let's go back to the demonstration we've already added this uh, March and December data here. They are in meters, unit of meters. So what we need to do is first find this water storage change by taking difference between March and December uh, TWS anomalies and multiply it by thousand to get it in millimeters so that it's consistent with um, precipitation in evapotranspiration. So for that, we can use raster calculator. Now notice that grace data are actually global data. Uh, we could not subset that, that provides global data. Here we have the subsetted files, but these are global data. So, but we're just going to focus on this region. So go to raster calculator. When you say select layer extent, it actually gives you the, the coordinates for this um, vector layer and so you can do that just to focus on that region and then you can save this file as say delta TWS so DTWS for DJF 16 and then you can save that and the calculation will be March TWS minus December TWS multiplied by 1000 so now we have Okay, this data in millimeter. We can turn these layers off and then zoom to this layer. So now we have this DTWS or Delta Water Storage. Um, this is given here. You can do a, you can do raster calculation uh, here and then add colors. Also, once you have these data sets. First thing we're going to do is look at the difference between precipitation and evapotranspiration transpiration between wet and dry season. You will also do this for 18 and 19 in your exercise. And for that, what you can do is go to raster calculator and save, uh, say, PR difference. And you can save this file what you will do is take I merge December, January, February minus I merge June, July, August and say OK. And then you will have this raster. You can follow the same with ET. So then you will have, you will go to raster calculator and subtract ET DJF minus ET JJA. And then you will have ET diff. And I have already done this calculation so that to save time. So what I'm going to do is go to this. And here, here is the final project. So here, let's see what we have. We have evapotranspiration difference between wet and dry season. As you can see, where there is more evapotranspiration um, in, in, in um, in, even in dry season and in wet season it's here so this is all negative uh, here this is positive where where of course it, uh, wet season uh, ev evapotranspiration dominates if you go to um, sorry PR this is the PR difference between wet and dry season here is where you have largest difference in the southern part of the basin uh, and you will check whether this is true for 1819 also. So, and we have this um, change in water storage, which I have
colored with uh, going to uh, raster properties, uh, change it to pseudo colors in Symbology, uh, pick appropriate range and color bar and then say OK. And similar to what Sean already demonstrated. So here is what it looks like for wet season. We have negative water storage in this part, positive in this part. Also notice that grace data are one degree by one degree data here. Uh, whereas precipitation um, is one tenth of a degree and evapotranspiration is even higher resolution, about 500 meters, so 0 0.004 degree. So all these have different resolution. And then if you look at GRACE data, these are large scale patterns. So in small basins, really to look at these data does not have a lot of accuracy or significance. Point to point data are not independent from each other. Original GRACE data are three degree by three degree approximately. So this is not independent information. And so you can only see this large scale pattern in changing terrestrial water. So keep that in mind. So if there is very small basin, there is no way to estimate how uh, this change is occurring. There are large uncertainties uh, are going to be there. But you can take basin average or if you take bigger sub basins with a number of points, um, still there are not that many compared to precipitation evapotranspiration, you get some idea of how much water um, is changing, uh, uh, terrestrial water is changing in this basin. So our focus is going to be looking at these bigger basins, but basically focus on basin average um, or accumulated water over the basin. So that is what we are going to do next. And for that, we're going to use uh, raster uh, zonal statistics. So we'll demonstrate that next. Okay, so we'll start with uh, the zonal statistics. What we want to do is find mean quantities over each sub basin and then accumulate over the entire basin. So the first step is to get mean quantity for each of them. And so for that, you can go here and look for zonal statistics, type it in the toolbox and click on zonal statistics. In the window, you will see option for a raster layer. Each of these rasters we are going to work with. So start with say precipitation for wet season and the vector layer containing zones is the Limpopo basin here. Output column prefix, uh, it, the output will be in a table. So this is the precipitation for wet season. So that's the prefix for that. Um, and for statistical calculation, there are many options, as you can see. You can keep them all or try different statistic, statistics. What we're going to do is just keep mean on because counts are going to be different for each layer as they all have different resolutions. And we're not looking at sum, but we're looking at average. So it, we will have millimeter uh, for meter square average for that basin. And so that's the quantity we're looking at. And then what instead of using counts, we're going to use area of each sub basin to work with uh, the amount of water. So once you do that, you can say OK and run. And then you get that calculation done. You can work through all the rasters. So June. Here you can say try run. You have to change each raster layer and change the uh, column prefix. So this is ETW run. And then for ET dry, and for change in water storage for wet season, you can say run. Once you do all these calculations, they're all stored in the attribute table. So click on the uh, vector layer and then say open attribute table. You will see 
different basins identified here such as you can click on these numbers and it shows you which basin it is so you can click on these numbers to see which basin it actually represents and then you can interpret uh, for different basins what's going on uh, let's deselect everything okay and so now the results are stored here in the table as you can see this is for each sub basin you have mean of dry a wet and dry season precipitation um, you have this uh, dry and wet evapotranspiration and this DTWS once you have this let's calculate area of each sub basin for that you will go here to open field calculator uh, let's name this column area we want decimal number uh, let's say 20 for a big number and then we don't we can have this two uh, digit precision and pick from geometry double click on this dollar area that provides area in meter square and then say okay once you do that you will have area for each sub basin in meter square and uh, you can quit this and what you can do is uh, highlight this layer go to layer and save as and then you can save this file as uh, let's see um, water remote sensing i'm just going to give any name because i just want to demonstrate something so just say save save okay and then you can go to this it's it, it that file is saved as um, csv file that you can check out um, here here is the file so now here you have area and you have all these columns what we want to do is first of all these are in millimeters so first thing you can do is you can check what is mean mean or average for entire basin it's simple you can just use this average function here by highlighting and so these are the basin average quantities in millimeters so this is all of this is in millimeter um, and what else you can do is again so here you can say that this is over entire basin this is mean precipitation wet season in millimeters conventionally what happens is that you look at um, if you want to look at total water amount what you do is multiply these means by area and so you you convert this millimeters into meters again and multiply by area to get a meter cube or volume of water and so that is the conventional way of looking at amount of water so it's cubic meters and then usually it is so many billions cubic meter when you add over the entire basin so what we're going to do here and i'm going to show one calculation uh, let's see we convert this prw in meter cube what you do is say equal this is n2 n2 star now multiply by area so this is s2 and multiplied by point, point zero zero 0.001 to get this all in meters and heat. So this is now this precipitation accumulated over this area. So this is the volume of water in this sub basin and you can just highlight and drag it. So this happens for all these. And so now what you have is uh, precipitation for wet season in me cubic meter and you can uh, sum it all over to do the entire basin you can sum this and so for that you can again 
highlight this and sum it or you can use a formula in which you are actually adding um, t2 to uh, t10 okay and oh sorry t equal to sum t2 to t10 and it's the same number that you will get but either way you can do it so then you can continue with dry season precipitation evapotranspiration for both seasons and change in water storage for wet seasons by multiplying uh, all these numbers by area and then finally adding it so you have me total meter cube basin accum accumulated uh, dry season precipitation volume i have calculated for all these columns um, and so let me so this is the file where I have calculated all these numbers so these are the numbers so this is precipitation for wet season um, dry season wet dry this so these numbers are in millimeters as we saw these are in billion uh, these are in cubic meters and then each of these number is actually multiplied by 10 to the minus 9 so here what you would do is equal uh, t12 um, multiplied by 10 raised to minus 9 and this gives you in billion cubic meters and so that is done for each of these so wet season precipitation volume is 72.9 in terms of billion cubic meters dry season is 7.9 uh, evapotranspiration is 40.8 um, for dry season it is 19.7 uh, this is rounded and then this is 5.9 about 6 billion cubic uh, meter the change in water storage so p minus e if you take for dry season which is p minus e it is about 32 billion cubic meters and the same for dry season is minus 11 here obviously precipitation dominates over evapotranspiration here you have more water loss to the atmosphere loss to the atmosphere compared to how much received via precipitation so now p minus e minus this number total water storage change would be can you can interpret that as um, whatever runoff you would get or discharge you would get which we don't have from this so that is more like a residual uh, keep in mind that these are all different data set different resolutions they may all have different error characteristics so sometimes it's um, not the absolute number that you want to look at but it's the change from uh, season to season or year to year it gives you idea of how overall water budget is changing based on this we cannot uh, e even if we take long term it will be difficult to close this water budget because we don't have explicit runoff information but in any case these are the numbers that you can see so if you uh, subtract p minus e minus uh, tw as change about six out of uh, um, say 32 so it will be 26 um, billion cubic meter so that would indicate that in wet season you might expect that much runoff um, in, in the basin so this concludes the demo part and you can start working on your exercise for um, wet and dry seasons of 2019 one more thing, we could have looked at entire year or longer time period also, but uh, because of the time limitations and the amount of data uh, that we have to go through, um, we've just focused on two seasons. You can apply the same methodology for, um, for entire year. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing this and you can start on your lab time. Before that, just um, please enter if you have any questions in the QA box and we will address them as we receive them 
and later on they will be also posted on, on the RSET website. Also, you can contact Sean or myself if you have any um, questions. So here is my email address and this is uh, Sean's. Also, a special acknowledgement and thank you to the scientists listed here. Um, they are experts in geodas and also in hydrology. And uh, we thank their guidance and explanation about estimation of water budget components from these different observations and then modeling uh, data as we will see next week. So that is Dr. Hiroko Bodova, uh, Dr. Augusto Jatirana, they're both from NASA Goddard, and Dr. Benjamin Seidchik, he's from Johns Hopkins University. So we really want to thank them for their help uh, with um, this webinar. So thank you and I'm going to stop um, this demonstration now and you can continue working on your lab time. So this is a lab time now for um, about uh, next hour or so, and then we will have a uh, question answer um, and discussion. Um, you have all the um, data sets you must have downloaded last week, or if you haven't, they are available um, already from the uh, training web page uh, or, or from the RCET website. So. Um, Make sure that you have all the data. You should have wet and dry season precipitation, evapotranspiration, as well as uh, change in terrestrial water storage. And then you will go through the exercise step by step uh, as the instruction is uh, instructions are given, and look at the numbers uh, of what you get. Uh, uh, and we are here. If you have any questions. Um, Please type them in the question box and uh, we will try to answer those. If you can, if you don't finish everything by end of this session, you can keep working on it uh, throughout the week and your homework uh, will have questions based on the exercise that you are doing for uh, year 2019. So uh, we will just um, be here. Um, and if you have any questions, we'll be answering those. Uh, but you can work on the exercise now. This is your lab time. So we can start with the question answer session in a minute or so. Hopefully you have been able to do um, progress on your exercise and whatever is left you have this week to finish. So next week, next week we will do the similar exercise, but instead of using remote sensing data, we will use global land data, assimilation data and see how the differences look. Um, in both remote sensing and modeling data, uh, what are the sources of uncertainties? Uh, we will see those. And um, uh, then you can work with GLDAS data as well next week. So um, we have some question answers already here. Um, uh, we'll go through them. And if you have anything more, you can type in the question box. So the first question is, what is the meaning of the numbers in slide 13 of the exercise two, specifically these large numbers and zero? So um, as Sean uh, explained here, um, in mod 16, uh, they don't calculate uh, evapotranspiration if it is just um, barren land or earth or water body, if it's permanent snow and ice, permanent wetland, urban or built up area. Um, and there are some unclassified values as well. So these are the numbers assigned to these different categories. Um, and we assign them all zero so that we can work easily in QGIS when we add all the, uh, all the rasters. If we had different uh, field values, it would be very difficult to do these things easily in QGIS. That's why we set them all to zero. But basically, these 
uh, numbers come for field value for different um, type of lens surface. Question two, is this process applicable for the perennial river like Ganges where water flow also through the melting glaciers as gray data is covering the melting of ice components also. So yes, GRACE does provide estimation of uh, total water storage, uh, so surface and groundwater, and melting of glaciers would be uh, would appear in the in, in the GRACE data. Uh, there is also if if you have permanent glaciers that also uh, there, there's adjustment done to the product but yes i think they should be able to provide uh, information uh, in ganges valley also precipitation is 0.1 degree and et 500 meters all the budget components in different resolutions so how are you doing the water balance is zone statistics a solution so uh, in this case because they are all different resolutions, zonal statistics is unfortunately is a simple solution in the sense that rather than looking at pixel by pixel values, now you are looking at um, average over the basin, average precipitation, average evapotranspiration, average total water storage change. That uh, is doable better than interpolating uh, all these data to uh, one special resolution because then you, you don't have information, you're not creating any new information, you're just interpolating with some rule. So you're making an assumption, so you are you may be introducing some inaccuracy. So better, we just wanted to stick with what the resolution of the data allowed us to do, and that's why we did this way. So er, earlier Sean had demonstrated using a range of values for dry and wet seasons, but used a different range of values for each file. Then classified them into 10 classes. Is there um, going to be a math calculation? So uh, no, actually that was just for demonstration. We looked at the range, um, Sean looked at the range and then picked a color app and divided values in, in some equal numbers. So you can use uh, you can choose intervals you like and color ramp you like. That should not be a problem. Um, this would not affect your, your final calculation. This is just for visualization. You may actually want to keep the same range and intervals for wet and dry season. So that clearly shows where the largest differences are that you can do. So why are we not downscaling the GRACE data sets? So as we mentioned previously, you, you can, uh, if, you, if you want to interpolate, you have to assume some interpolation scheme. Is it linear or cubic or, you know, so you're assuming that groundwater within that grid is distributed in, in certain way. And um, that's not always true. So you can mathematically or for computational ease, you can do that. But whether you are actually getting correct information at that at higher resolution, it's questionable. That's why we did not downscale data. Um, isn't it better to calculate volumetric P and it is using cumulative product sum instead of uh, using mean rate values? Yeah, so yes, if we had same resolution, uh, we probably can do that. But as in the previous uh, two questions, as we saw, if you want to do that, um, you have to interpolate data and then um, uh, we don't know how you, you can do it both ways and see uh, how how different the answers are yeah. interpolate all on the same resolution to pixel by pixel calculation and then sum rather than taking mean but because of the resolution and because we did not want to interpolate uh, by using some assumption we just did it this way So water storage units that we saw in the Excel table that they are in billion cubic meters and you can convert easily to maybe billion cubic feet if you like. But uh, original data are in millimeters. So um, 
says I'm having trouble adding the Impopular Bayesian shape file. Um, so it could be the QGIS version that you're using, or if once you calculate statistics, you should see the attribute table. If you don't see when you um, click on the shape file, you can check on the top um, option bars. There is sometimes there is an icon for attribute table that you might be able to click on and see the numbers. Ah, yes, so question nine. Um, TWS, we just did it for one season because September for Grace uh, 2016 was missing. That's why we just did one season. And this is a good place to talk about missing data. If you go through Grace records, there are several months uh, they're missing for one reason or another. There may be some adjustment or calibration going on or some battery issues. Um, so then uh, they, the data are missing. And then how would you do this change in water storage? So what you can do is, first of all, maybe say September was missing in 2016 here. You can take mean September for multiple years and you say that, okay, this is the best we can do. We are assuming that September 2016 was more or less average uh, terrestrial water storage anomaly that you can do or uh, what you can do is um, and this is again there are several assumptions but you can take another year where you have precipitation and evapotranspiration which are not too different than 2016 you can say okay i'm going to pick september missing month from this year and assume that my water storage is this but in any case you will be introducing some um, inaccuracies or you know, uh, uncertainties that you don't know but that's the that's the only way because the data are missing and only way to work with it is by assuming either from other uh, existing months you and or um, maybe just then you have to uh, leave that season out like we did here So why did we reclassify value range? ET addition is not clear. Uh, this was actually for the raster calculation is in QGIS. If we were using Python or, or, or R, if you were actually programming, you can individually say a set threshold that you don't want to count these different field values. But in QGIS, uh, through this GUI, it's not, uh, easy to work with multiple missing values when you do calculation or when you add ET rasters for entire season. That's why um, we, we we reclassified and specified one field value that we can control. So I do not see the reclassify value. Um, yeah, we will look into this because um, if you have an older version of QGIS, I know that 3.6 uh, did not have um, reclassified uh, layer. So that 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 has a different option. So this could be a version of QGIS. In homework two of week two, it says I have to email the CSV file. So yes, uh, please save the attribute table. Just um, highlight the uh, Limpopo River Basin vector layer and then go to layer on top bar and save as. Um, you can go through the demonstration and then it shows you how to save this as CSV file and then you can attach it to the email for the homework. In QGIS 3.14, how do I enable Google under math service. Um, if you go to web and click, you will see quick map service and there are options. Um, if you don't even see quick map services, then you probably need to install that plugin. But otherwise it is straightforward 3.14. What will be the ideal size of the water basin to optimize output result? Uh, so Grace data, they, uh, their native resolution is about 150,000 kilometers square. Each 
pixel is about that much. So if you have a watershed that is smaller than that, um, you, you don't have very accurate information as we saw in the Limpopo River Basin. The, the smaller sub-basins, you just have one big value from surrounding sub-basins also, it's the same. So really that's not very accurate. So ideally anything bigger than 150,000 kilometers square, you will have at least one whole pixel in that watershed. Um, we will see next week that if you we will use GLDAS that uh, up to a certain extent, um, you can work with a little higher resolution than that. Uh, what's the best way to calculate discharge using remote sensing? So uh, it, basically water balance equation that we have in presentation in week one, we had it that basically you are taking difference of precipitation minus evapotranspiration and, and the water storage in, in the ground. When you take all that, um, whatever is left as a residual is, you can assume that it's, it's going as runoff or discharge. So in theory, this is true. But in practice, you are actually taking subtraction of big numbers like precipitation, evapotranspiration, and TWS. All of them have errors because of observations, uh, the way they have been derived with different spatial and temporal samplings. So in, in practice, when you take that difference, the residual also has large error and so your discharge values are uh, may not be very accurate or you know you, you, it, you have to assess accuracy of that number and you can only do that if you have stream gauge data or you have some way to estimate discharge from in situ data or if you have a good calibrated hydrologic model in your watershed maybe then you have a good idea of you know how you know how accurate you get values you're getting from remote sensing. For a closed basin, you have a large lake at the center that gets inflows from all upstream sub-basins. Is that true to say a portion of TWS is due to lake level change? So it, yes, so GRACE actually does um, take into account all water. So change in lake level if you know if it changes earth's gravitational field it would be reflected in grace data um if you only thing is that you cannot desegregate grace data vertically it's just one column of water that that you have so to be certain what you can do is over several months take lake level height if you have measurements and take grace tws anomalies and see how good they are are correlating and in that then you you can be you may be able to say that yes portion of very vari variation that you see in grace is because of this lake level change so calculate the water budget for a river basin of 10000 kilometers square is it possible not by using grace data um you will have to use a GLDAS model. We will see next week, um, and then you you can, uh, you know, 10,000 kilometers square. So there are other assumptions, as we will see. Some um, GLDAS versions they have um, terrestrial water storage term in them. Some they don't. They have uh, shallow water, groundwater in the sense they have soil moisture to certain depth and then snow water equivalent. So you have to then use that as your shallow groundwater information. So there are trade-offs between, uh, for small basins especially, um, when you use GLDAS data, you also have to see how uh, water storage has been derived in there. But with remote sensing, with GRACE data, um, it's not possible uh, to such small basins. So for MODIS data, um, you can look at this um, documentation, which provides information about uncertainties. Um, in the presentation next week, we will also have some references which show how MOD 16 um, is sensitive to what kind of land characteristics you are working with. Uh, errors uh, and uncertainties depend on that also. 
how certain is the water budget? How can we decrease the uncertainty? So we will discuss this next week when we have looked at model-based water budget components also so that we can have a range um, of differences we see from remote sensing and also from uh, two different models. And based on that, uh, we, we have good idea what kind of uncertainties are there in which field. How to reduce them is a um, little tricky. It has to be done regionally that if you use um, ensemble model, uh, modeling approach in which which are which you force with good weather and remote sensing information, also assimilate remote sensing information such as soil moisture. Um, in situ data can also be used as constraint. So that becomes a little complex that you regionally have to develop a solution for, for more accurate water budget estimation. I mean, uh, unfortunately, it is still challenging with, with all these data sets and models out there, as we will see next week, still um, solutions have to be regional by river basin by river basin or watershed by watershed. Will the result change if you use satellite images with different pixel resolution? Um, it, it is possible because um, when, you are, when you have lower resolution, you are integrating information over a bigger area. When you have higher resolution information, you already, you know, then, there is a difference, so you you might not uh, you might not see like a huge difference, it, but quantitative numbers will change. Yes, when when the resolution changes. So again, this is if you interpolate data, that's it. That's a totally different issue then. But if observations themselves have different resolutions or higher resolution. Yes, you have more information in that case and numbers will change. Okay, the original ET is um, actually millimeter scaled by, um, it multiplied by 10, so it is not in centimeters. Can we use this method to estimating evapotranspiration for any basin for a research work? Is this method accurate? So when you say method, you are perhaps talking about the data set. So can you use mod 16 or can you use GLDAS based ET? Um, for research, definitely you can use these numbers and see um, how accurate they are. And it, they, again, we will talk about this next week, but there's going to be um, a program, um, it's called OpenET, in which uh, evapotranspiration data from many different sources will be available. And so you can use that. Uh, Mod 16 um, perhaps is not the most accurate. I mean, uh, people, there are uh, studies which show that in certain regions, especially in arid region, they may have biases, but um, best way to look at is soil moisture and vegetation and other parameters in your area for research and look at evapotranspiration, how things are changing and you can perhaps assess uh, which product is best. Uh, on page 16, it says sum up 13 reclassified rasters. Shouldn't it be 26? So it, it is, I, uh, Sean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it is per season, 13 rasters. So for two seasons, there may be 26, right? Hi, Mita, that's correct. Yeah, so for the 13 rasters are for the dry season, and then you would repeat those steps for the different 13 uh, files for the wet season. So you're not actually adding all 26 together. You're 13 for one season, 13 for another. So in here, um, why haven't we used soil hydrophysical data? 
So because GRACE data is integrating soil moisture information and ground info groundwater information as one water thickness column, we did not use um, soil data, soil moisture data or soil hydrophysical data in this. When, when you look at certain land surface model data, then you would be looking at uh, soil moisture data and soil hydrophysical data for sure. Is there any easy way to get validation data of ET in forested areas? As I mentioned, uh, open ET that I think in 2021, it will be out with multiple ET products. Um, and, and then um, there will be indications which you might use for validation in forest area. Uh, what about regional recharges to shallow aquifers that affect the revap factor in ET calculations? Um, uh, no, I don't think it's it, it's included in here. So that um, that uncertainty would be there. Uh, how close are GRACE data to real values? Are there some studies to demonstrate it? Um, if you look at the GRACE webinar that Arset presented a few weeks ago, there are some references or studies which show uncertainties in, in GRACE data. Um, based on the algorithm validation itself, it is two to three centimeters um, error. So I, I would say about 10 to 20 percent uh, uncertainties are there. Uh, question 28, is hyperspectral imagery being employed in water budget monitoring? If so, does spectral unmixing have any significance in water budget analysis? So, um, I'm not aware of any study which uses hyperspectral imagery to do water budget monitoring. Um, th there are, um, so the evapotranspiration, say from eco stress, is there, but that's from thermal data. Sorry, I'm not thinking. So, no, I'm not aware of any such study. So I, I think um, uh, we want to, you know, most of we have we're done with all the questions here, and these are all good questions. Um, and you can continue working with the exercise uh, this week. Next week, when we come back, what we will do is we'll look at GLDAS-based water budget components. We will show comparison with remote sensing data on annual uh, water budget data. Uh, mostly for demonstration purpose. Um, also, what one thing to recommend here is that you these data that we used, iMERGE, ET, and GRACE data, they're all long-term, like more than a decade-long data sets are there. So if you do time series analysis, then you and then compare with in situ data in your watershed, you might get a better idea of how uh, well they correspond to the values you see in your watershed. For the time limitations during these webinars, we haven't gone through like entire year or entire one year cycle in water, but well, ideally you can do it for multiple years, then you get a better sense of how these remote sensing observations are mimicking what you see in your watershed. So that's a recommendation that we could not follow in the webinar because of the time constraint. So hopefully we'll continue working with this and submit um, homework too in time. And we will see you next week for the final session of this webinar in which we will focus on GLDAS-based water budget components. Um, and we thank you for attending today's session. And we hope to see you next week at the same time.
Okay. Uh, we also want to thank our team here for um, helping us. Um, that is, uh, we have, uh, along with Sean McCartney and myself, we have uh, Brock Levins, Jonathan O'Brien, and Selvin Hudson Odoi. Uh, they help us in many ways in editing, in creating this meeting, and corresponding with everyone. So thank you very much, everyone, for setting up this webinar. And thank you all for participating. We, we will see you next week.